Hello everyone. This video, like all of our best classes, is going to begin with a Star Wars reference. I would probably be playing the Star Wars theme at this point, but, well, I don't want this video to get taken down by a copyright claim. Regardless, in today's video lecture, we're going to be talking about setting. How setting is created, the purpose of setting, the relationship between setting, theme, character, and the other elements of storytelling that we've discussed up until this point. Now, our story starts a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. This phrase establishes a certain set of expectations. We instinctively connect it with those Star Wars films. We have traditional feelings or uh, connections to that phrase, or at least some of us do. This phrase calls to mind in its description of a particular setting, images of adventure and wonder. Also, familial connection because of the personal associations that I have with it. I remember sitting as a five-year-old child in my living room, watching the Star Wars films with my older brothers, feeling that connection, being able to share something with them. Now, not every description of setting is going to draw upon those associations and those recollections that we have. But what I've just identified is a key element of setting, symbolism, and connotation on which authors rely. And we're going to delve into those kinds of ideas in this lecture. As a breakdown of what we're going to be discussing in this video, first, we're going to talk about the purpose of setting, what setting is used for by authors and creative writers like yourselves. We'll look at the elements of setting, what goes into the creation of setting, and those things about which you have to think as you are developing the settings for your stories. We'll look at a review and analysis setting in context. In other words, we'll be looking at examples of setting, specific passages pertaining to setting, and the overarching setting of the story that I asked you to read for today's class, The Cask of Amontillado. And then we're going to talk about how we um, actually develop settings inside the creative response pieces that I'll want you to write for your next series of journal entries. They'll be posted on the Omnivox forum. Starting out, before you move on to the next slide, and in fact, before we move on to the next part of this slide, which describes some of the functions of setting inside stories, I'd like you to think about some of the texts that you've read, short stories, novels, or even films, right? media texts rather than written literary texts. How does setting function in those works? What contributes to setting? What makes a good setting? And how have authors used setting in effective ways? What is the purpose of setting in these works? Pause the video for a minute, take a few moments to think about that question, think about examples, and consider the use of setting in those uh, contexts. Now that you're back, we can take a look at a few of the answers that I have arrived at. First, setting can be used to heighten dramatic effect. In other words, um, the sentiments, the feelings inspired by setting can correspond with those that the author desires to inflict on the reader because of the emotional impact of the setting in the narrative, the dramatic effect of the work. In other words, the impact that the author wants to have on the reader, the feelings that he wishes to engender, can be modulated and enhanced. Setting also creates expectations regarding narrative, its focus, values, and directions. The moment that I hear the phrase, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, or the more traditional phrase from whence that one derived, a long time ago in a kingdom far, far away, I immediately have expectations for the story that is to follow. A certain set of generic conventions are going to be employed in this work, and I am given access to those, or I'm given a point of entry into the set of values and expectations for that story by way of the setting. It doesn't always have to be so bald-faced or obvious as in the case of a long time ago in a kingdom far, far away or in a land far, far away. But those expectations uh, based on cultural presumptions, historical expectations, or historical background knowledge are established by the kind of setting that is depicted throughout the story, not just in those opening lines. When I hear a long time ago in a land far, far away, I immediately know I'm dealing with a fairy tale. There's going to be some sort of fantastical or magical element to it. It's probably going to be didactic and instructive. The setting gives me access to these kinds of values and expectations for the story. It also inspires judgments and charges the story with a certain emotion. 
If I understand the setting of a story, for instance, if the story is set in, on a battlefield in World War II, the author doesn't need to do as much in order to establish the kinds of emotions that he wishes us to understand in the work. Likewise, if the story is set in the South prior to the Civil War, you're dealing with a plantation house or a manor house. Automatically, we have certain value judgments that we bring to the text that the author doesn't have to establish. We're already looking at it through the expected lens of a kind of racialized narrative. So looking at the setting can inspire inherent judgments of the narrative that is to follow. It also triggers memories and associations. Like I said, I can't watch a Star Wars film without thinking of my elder brothers and sharing the experience of those films with them. It's one of the reasons that I adore them as much as I do. Um, but these are things that sometimes are not just unique and specific to a particular member of the audience. Films or short stories, novels can all draw upon the, what they assume to be common background experiences of their audiences or of their readers. There's a certain assumption of the um, implicit or implied reader for this story that are made. Setting also helps to define character, in that characters are, in many respects, a product of their setting. They're a product of the times and places and situations that surrounded them as they grew up and developed. And they're also the products of those in which they are existing now. For instance, um, who you are at this very moment has been influenced and colored, shaped and changed by the fact that we are engaged in this rather unusual form of teaching. Many of you have been, unfortunately, confined to your homes or you feel that you should um, uh, self-quarantine. That situation, this historical context or this historical moment, helps to determine who we are and how we respond. In order to help you to think about these issues, I'd like you to start to explore a pair of paintings. We'll tie the ideas behind the questions I ask pertaining to these paintings into setting. But every work of art, like I said, whether it's a visual work of art or a film, a short story or a novel, they all have a kind of setting, a kind of background context. What I'd like you to do is to take a look at these two paintings, two radically different paintings, two radically different styles. Pause the video and think about the question that I ask. What are some of the differences between the two, these two paintings and their backgrounds? Think about the visual techniques being used here, the relationship between background and subjects and the like. Try to compare and contrast these two paintings and the relationships between the foregrounded subjects and the backgrounds of the images. All right, now that you're back, we can discuss some of the answers that I have come up with to this central question. If you look at the painting in the top left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see that the girl who is dressed and prepared for her first communion is radically offset from the background. She is ornate, elaborate, and at the center, at the heart of her, is an explosion of color. Pale, yes, faded out, but a stark contrast to the background. In the painting on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, we have a background that blends into the point of indistinguishability with the foregrounded characters. Now, there are a number of other things that we can say about this. We can delve into the techniques that the authors use in a great little bit more detail. But the basic answer to that question is the one that I'd like to highlight in, with respect to the development of character. Setting in the context of a story can function in exactly the same way as it does in these two illustrations. Either the intricate details of the character can be highlighted and offset against the background. The background can recede into um, almost meaninglessness. Or it can become an integral component that it influences and bleeds into the character themselves. In the first case, the painting on the top left, you have a character whose details are actually made all the more resplendent because of the distinction between her depiction and that of the background. In the illustration on the bottom, the background has almost as much significance as do the foregrounded characters. And the characters in that background seem to have the same uh, degree of care put into their composition as do the foregrounded characters, the two women standing in the front. Setting inside a story can serve either purpose or can operate in the same way. The girl who's preparing herself for communion 
and has been dressed in this uh, radiant, pristine, pure white gown, is set off against the background. Something about the beauty of that action is highlighted. Something about her character's motivations and her intended actions in this moment are highlighted. Or the background can blend in with the character, harmonize with the nature of the character. Here, in that first image, you have a background that is in conflict with the character. In the second image, the background, the color palette, the illustrations, the images, the actions of characters behind the main character or the foregrounded characters all blend in. They fit. They harmonize with the depiction of that character in the foreground. Setting and stories can work in the exact same way, depending on the kind of technique that you wish to employ and the purpose that you have for the setting that you're creating. Setting um, also helps to define the relationship between characters and the environment in which they have developed. The color, tone, and expectations of that setting informs our interpretation of the character. For instance, if a character is utterly unlike that which we would expect for the setting, or if something about the character's nature is distinct from that setting, as in that first illustration, those aspects of the character become all the more important or shocking to us. Setting, however, does not just pertain to the background of the character. It doesn't just set up a backdrop for that character to perform on or a stage on which that character could perform. Instead, that setting can also be viewed as a part of the character. In the Orla by Guy de Maupassant, the narrator begins his tale of woe and horror by saying this, I like this part of the country. I am fond of living here because I am attached to it by deep roots, the profound and delicate roots which attach a man to the soil on which his ancestors were born and died, to their traditions, their usages, their food, the local expressions, the peculiar languages of the peasants, the smell of the soil, the hamlets, and the atmosphere itself. I love the house in which I grew up. In other words, we are the environment in which we have developed. We're the sum of our experiences inside that context, and all of us are this amalgamation of the different traditions and associations and pieces of the heritage that have contributed to make us who we are. I love those deep roots, those profound and delicate roots which attach a man to the soil on which his ancestors were born on died and died, to their traditions, their usages, their food, the local expressions, all of these minutiae surrounding the narrator as he developed and grew into the man that he is today made him who he is. He is as much a part of that setting as any other element with there within. So setting defines characters rather than just highlighting them. It creates a context for character development. We have certain expectations for the kind of person who would emerge from a backwater slum and a rural uh, farmhouse. These different settings contribute to the nature of this character. They inform his identity based on the cultural traditions and inheritances that he has and the history that is impregnated into that place. Every character grows from and emerges from a particular setting. So I will give you an example. I've already talked about uh, Star Wars briefly today, so now we have to talk about Star Trek. Have to get all the major science fiction franchises in. Star Trek The Next Generation uh, features Captain Picard, and he has also appeared in the recent Picard series, which I have encouraged you not to watch, so please don't. Captain Picard is a Renaissance man. He is a man who has devoted his life to the scientific and philosophical exploration of the universe. His family had a, a sort of ancient hereditary vineyard. His father was insistent that Captain Picard, Jean-Luc Picard and his brother, remain at the farm and learn how to tend it, to take on this family tradition. Picard, however, rebelled against this life and became so devoted to the exploration of philosophy because his father was against it. Likewise, um, the context of his development in that rural setting made him fascinated by technology and encouraged him to explore the universe scientifically. He wanted to see what was out there because his own upbringing was so limited. He wanted to explore the stars because of the mundane and prosaic surroundings of his youth. So the expectations, the uh, limitations of the environment which he found himself as a child and as a young teen 
turned him into the man that he would become or helped determine the man that he became. Okay. Atmosphere is the general tone or feeling of the entire piece, or I should say it is the general feeling of the piece. As time and place are elements of setting, then, setting itself is one of the ways in which authors can try to construct a particular atmosphere for their piece. So tone, an attitude taken by the narrative voice towards the environment, can change depending on the nature of that environment, depending on how you set your, where you set your story, when you set your story. The emotional resonance of that narrative voice is going to change. His judgments or her judgments, its judgments, are going to be different. Atmosphere itself is the accumulated sensations and emotions of a scene or a piece. The, the atmosphere of a story then could be satirical, joyous, sinister, or solemn. And it can vary depending on the context and the particular moment of that story, as I think it does in the story that I asked you to read for today's class, The Cask of Montiato by Edgar Allan Poe. Tone and setting always influence each other. There's this kind of mutually defining relationship between tone and setting. Our appreciation and understanding and response to the setting of the story is influenced or colored by the narrator, narrative voice's um, emotional response to the story as well. It's colored or shaped by the perspective that is signaled to us by the narrative voice. Likewise, however, that narrative voice, as it has a kind of character of its own, responds to the setting. So they work together, mutually defining, in order to create atmosphere. Mood, then, is suggested by place and time. As in those earlier examples that I provided, these are often defined by connotations and expectations for a particular location, as well as concrete, specific details. When we hear the word, for instance, mansion, we automatically associate that term with certain series of connotations. We think about wealth and opulence. Perhaps we think about greed. Those connotations, those associations that we have for those individual words or those descriptions or those particular settings inform our response to and mood regarding that piece at the moment. It draws on our expectations for a given location, the kinds of events that can happen there, the feelings that characters should expect, expect to have in those contexts. But it also relies on concrete details, the specific language and ideas that are being used to describe the setting. So, a brief summary of setting and its purpose in size stories. Setting always has to do more than simply set context. Setting can be, in the hands of a writer who is not employing it judiciously and consciously, a mere perfunctory addition to the text. It can be functional, so it establishes when and where the story is taking place, but nothing more than that. It's a good starting point, but setting, like those specific details or descriptions of characters' actions, should do more than simply exist for their own purposes. Setting should inspire judgment of the situation, lifestyles, and context. So when we look at a description of setting, is that setting drawing from our associations, our background knowledge, in order to help us to judge what's going on in that context? Do we judge the lifestyles and the situations of characters? And that doesn't necessarily mean judge them morally or negatively, but do we have an opinion on the particular context in which the story is set? Setting should also impart information and emotion. Do we learn something about the characters, their relationships, or the like through the description of setting? For instance, if the characters are living in a dilapidated home, the setting tells us something about them. They're isolated in the countryside. Likewise, the home is falling apart. We don't have to be told that they're poor. The setting shows us that they're poor. It also illuminates and establishes character. The fact that these two women, for instance, live in a dilapidated home tells us that they don't really care about external appearances. As we saw in those initial illustrations, it can contrast or complement the characters. It highlights certain elements of their character, showing us that they rebel against the expectations or lifestyles of that particular setting, or have been subsumed by it and become a part of it. It can suggest a symbolic undercurrent to the work. 
So the evolution of setting can correspond symbolically with certain elements of the themes or uh, the characters within the story. And it also establishes tone, atmosphere, and mood. So when you think about writing setting in the stories that you're developing or in the works of flash fiction that you're developing, try to make sure that just like characterization, action, dialogue, it's doing double duty. It's not just existing for its own sake, but it's contributing to the story in these myriad ways. The elements of setting. Some of the things that make up the setting of the story are geography, so the location, the physical landscape, the weather, and the location or locale. The social context. Who lives there? Is it an urban environment or a rural environment? What kind of buildings are there? What kind of social structures are there? Is it wealthy or poor or impoverished? What are the inhabitants like? Who are they? How have these people influenced the protagonist? Has the protagonist embraced their presumptions, their values? Or are they like Captain Picard, rejecting the traditions and the expectations of the environment in which they grew up? Think about the man-made geography of the entire place. How has humanity transformed it socially, emotionally, culturally? Sensory details contribute to setting. So as you're describing setting, make it real, make it lived in by activating as many senses as you can. You don't want to draw it out. You don't want to have belabored elaborations on setting. But can you activate the senses of your readers to make it real? Can they touch it? Can they see it? Can they smell it? Can they taste it? Can they hear it? Time. The year, the season, the time of day, all of them create different emotional resonances, all of them inform the characters and create expectations for what characters should be doing. If we have a character walking down the street in the middle of the day, we have a different set of expectations or beliefs about who this character might be or what this character might be doing, or the story that might develop as a result of him walking down the street than we would if he was walking down the street in the middle of the night. And look at the history of this place. When you're talking about the time of year, the year in which the story is set, or the particular place, what can you expect your audience to understand about the story? All right. Now we're going to apply some of these concepts that we've described in this video to the story I asked you to read for today, The Cask of Montiato by Edgar Allan Poe. I would like you to submit your responses to these questions on turnitin.com, and they'll be graded as part of your in-class work mark. First, break down the setting of the story in terms of the elements of setting described on the last slide or on the previous slide. Then, find two specific quotations that describe setting in the story. How do these quotations highlight character, reveal theme, create atmosphere, inspire judgment, draw on associations or connotations, our expectations for this particular setting, and the like? How can we analyze and break down Edgar Allan Poe's use of setting in this story? All right, once you've finished with that activity, I'd like you to take a look at these two examples of the way in which authors are leveraging our expectations for setting in order to create particular effects. The first example derives from Chronopolis by J.G. Ballard. In this story, he describes a man inside of a prison cell. Luckily, his cell faced south and sunlight traversed it for most of the day. He divided its arc into ten equal segments, the effective daylight hours, marking the intervals with a wedge of mortar pried from window ledge. Each segment he further subdivided into twelve smaller units. The questions I'd like you to consider here are what feelings are created by the description of setting? How are these feelings created? Look for significant details. Do they fit with our expectations for the setting of a prison? Pause the video for a moment and think about those questions. All right, now that you're back, our expectations for the prison are uh, that it will be a place of misery and sorrow. Likewise, when we think about that setting, we consider that it will be a place wherein a character will have no agency or control of his own life, perhaps a place of chaos and disorder or order that has been forced from outside. There is a kind of disharmony between our expectations and the setting itself. This prison is almost cheerful. 
The prisoner has control over his environment. He's able to uh, create a means of timekeeping, and the prison itself is suffused with sunlight. The window faces south, and the sunlight traverses it for most of the day. It's a place of light and life, as opposed to misery and squalor. So, in a few sentences, the author has taken our expectations and begun to call them into question. Now, I'd like you to take a look at another example. In this uh, particular passage, a battlefield is being described. The rain fed fungus that grew in the men's boots and socks, and their socks rotted, and their feet turned white and soft so that the skin could be scraped off with a fingernail. And Stink Harris woke up screaming one night with a leech on his tongue. When it was not raining, a low mist moved across the paddies, blending the elements into a single gray element. And the war was cold and pasty and rotten. What feelings are created here? How are these feelings created? And do they fit with our expectations for a battlefield? Pause the video and think about this question. Now that you're back, I think it's quite clear that the description of the hardships that the soldiers are called upon to endure, the gray, dismal, um, unending weight in squalor and misery, this dull, gray, um, almost purgatory, is essentially what we'd expect for a battlefield. So our expectations in this case are validated. However, those expectations are moved from the abstract and the impersonal to um, the intimate and the visceral. There's weight and depth, color, ironically, in this dull, gray, and horrifying setting. Things to think about as you are attempting to create a setting in your story. First of all, consider when and where you want to set your story. What you have to think about or what you want to ask yourself as you are contemplating that question is, what time period or place would best inform or define the characters? The character that I want to create or the character about whom I'm thinking is going to arise from a particular sociological and historical context. Which of those contexts would best suit him or her? What feelings do I want to, the setting to create? What words can help to create those sensations? Look for those specific concrete details and those specific terms that can help you to create the feelings that you want to engender in your reader. Just as we examined that last example of the battlefield, think about the particular words that the author is using here in order to create the, the visceral and real sensations of, that concretize our expectations. Does the background setting highlight something about my character? What are my audience's expectations for my setting? Can I use those expectations or subvert them? Why? Whatever you're doing with respect to your audience's or your intended audience's expectations, try to be purposeful. Why are you trying to subvert those expectations? Why are you trying to accord with them? What kind of emotional resonance, what kind of themes do you want to examine or convey? And lastly, what do I need to tell my audience about my setting? What do they already know due to background knowledge? Now, here again, you're making a certain set of assumptions regarding your audience's understanding of certain issues in your setting or in your history. However, you can look at a generalized reader or think about the information that might be available through education, through cultural osmosis to your readers. What are they going to expect or what are they going to know about your setting? And how can you use that to cut back unnecessary details?